and uh, please give you a presentation. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Alex Vines. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, good, more, good afternoon. <laughs> Sorry. You will appreciate that I have been traveling, so morning and evening is quite, uh, it's quite a challenge. Let me take this very early opportunity to thank the management of Chatham House for providing me with this platform to engage um, this think tank and uh, people in this uh, global space on matters to do with the subject that uh, you have asked me to speak on. Elections in Kenya, challenges and opportunities for shared prosperity. Um, I was here about three and a half years, three years and a few months and a bit. Uh, and then I discussed about what I saw, Kenya, a generally optimistic view of what I, I thought about, about our country and in the context of our region, the challenges that we face in that uh, part of the world. We live in a, uh, in a neighborhood that has many uh, challenges, but uh, in that context, Kenya still stands out as the place that can provide the necessary stability and the anchor for the engagement of our region with the rest of the world. On 9th of August this year, the people of Kenya will go to polls and we will have an election. A lot has been said about that election. I want to commit on this platform that we will work and deploy every resource in um, that's it, within our ability to make sure that our election is free, is fair, and is peaceful. Um, we have confidence in the Independent Electoral and Boundaries Commission that they can deliver a credible election if um, they are properly resourced, they are supported both by government and uh, our development partners and friends, as has been the tradition of uh, support to IEBC. That election is uh, a decisive election. I may also call it a transition election because in it we have either to transit into a prosperous Kenya or we could regress into something else. There are largely, from where I stand, there are three propositions on the ballot this year. Number one is our democracy and constitutionalism. That's on the ballot this year. On our side, we believe that the way to the future is to consolidate our democracy by completing the implementation of our 2010 constitution that is largely a very progressive constitution that provides for checks and balances, that uh, separates the judiciary from the executive, from the legislature, and provides a system of checks and balances, builds in accountability, ensures that we have shared uh, prosperity with our robust county system of government, 
and our county governments that have become a very big celebration by the people of Kenya of that shared prosperity. On the other side of the divide, of course, we have our competitors who now have doubts about our 2010 constitution. They have proposed a raft of amendments in the region of 72 different amendments in an exercise called the BBI process. And they want to bring back an imperial presidency. They want more power given to the president. They want the president to have power over the judiciary. They want the president to appoint an entity called ombudsman that seeks to supervise and superintend the judiciary. They want the president to go back to appointing ministers from parliament, which in our opinion undermines the oversight responsibility of parliament. If you inject members of the executive into parliament, we go back straight where we were before the new constitution. So on one side, we think we should be able to consolidate our democracy and complete the implementation of the new constitution. On the other side, they want to amend the constitution and take us back where we came from 30 years ago. The second item on the ballot is our political culture. We believe that our focus should be building institutions, institutionalizing our governance, institutionalizing our politics, institutionalizing our accountability, and institutionalizing all the oversight responsibilities and our progress. What do I mean by this? On one side, we believe we must build our politics around political parties. We've painstakingly been part of building national political parties. I was a member of Kanu when Kanu was a national political party. I was a member of ODM when we built it as a national political party. I participated in building Jubilee as a national political party. Today, we have built the largest, most popular political party, the United Democratic Alliance, and we have built the largest, most popular political formation with our partners in NC and partners in Fort Kenya under the Kenya Kwanzaa Alliance. On the other side, many believe that politics should be built around personalities and personality outfits. The question I often am asked is, how will you succeed in your presidential campaign unless you have the support of Uhuru Kenyatta, or the next guy, or the next guy, oblivious of the fact that we have built the largest political party to many people. And that's the culture we need to deal with, is that the institution of a political party, they don't see the value of it. They see the personalities. And that's why the contest in this election 
is on one side, we have the team that I belong to, the team that I lead. We believe that this contest should be framed around a national political party and a national political movement rather than on personalities and individuals, number one. We believe that we should build our politics around an accountable executive and an accountable government with clear demarcations of the opposition and the government. The competit our competitors on the other side seem to have bloodlines between what is government and what is the opposition. The result which you see today in Kenya, there is no government and there is no opposition. Today in Kenya, you have a mongrel of a governance system. You don't know whether it is the government that is in the opposition or the opposition is the one that is in government. Today, the leader of the opposition is a project of the system and the deep state of government. And unfortunately, the leader of what is supposed to be the ruling party is actually a squatter or is it a refugee in the opposition party. So we have quite a situation. And it's because of that that we believe we must not build our politics around individuals. We must build our politics around institutions. If we had built our even engagements around political parties, we wouldn't have ended in the situation that Kenya is in today, where we cannot, we have opposition members chairing government uh, committees. We have uh, uh, the leader of government being the foremost supporter of the leader of opposition. The third issue on that subject of political culture and building institutions. Today, anywhere in Kenya, people will tell you the fight, apart from the oversight responsibility of the opposition over government being compromised because of the lack of institutionalization of our, of our, of our, of our governance. Today, anybody in Kenya will tell you um, the fight against corruption is laced largely with political persuasion. If you, uh, if you have challenges of having stolen from the public, you only need to be a friend you only need to profess that you support the handshake and you support the BBI and you will have no consequences. It is our belief that accountability should be built and institutionalized. That's why we believe that the very first thing we must do in completing the implementation of the Constitution is to operationalize what the Constitution provides for, the Judiciary Fund, to give the judiciary the capacity, the financial independence, to be able to deploy their full potential in discharging their constitutional mandate of adjudicating on disputes, 
dealing with matters of accountability, dealing with matters of corruption, so that corruption cases do not take 10 years because the judiciary is undercapacitated because they do not have the resources to hire the personnel, the magistrates, the judges, the software, the hardware, to be able to discharge their responsibility. <coughs> At the very first instance, it's our commitment that we must operationalize the judiciary fund and get the judiciary to do independently what they are supposed to do. The second item is the entire criminal justice system, from the DCI to the Inspector General and all the investigative authorities in between, must also be given what con the Constitution says their financial independence. Today, the IG, the Inspector General, the DCI, they run independent offices, but they depend on the office of the president for their finances. They do not have financial independence. There is a common saying, he who pays the piper calls the tube. So if somebody else is paying, that's how they decide who you go after and who you don't go after. That's how they decide if you are on this side of the political divide, there are no resources to prosecute. And if you are on this other side of the divide, there are resources to prosecute. We believe the criminal justice system should be truly independent by not us having constitutional independence, but having financial independence to discharge their responsibility. Institutions, institutionalizing the fight against corruption, institutionalizing accountability, institutionalizing oversight. That way, we will be on the trajectory of getting Kenya where we want. So, what's on the ballot? Those of us who believe we should institutionalize our politics along political party lines, institutionalize accountability by having clear separation between the opposition and government, institutionalizing the fight or accountability by making sure that the judiciary is independent, the institution of uh, the criminal justice system is independent, not just by constitution, but financial and operational independence as well. Rather than build this uh, around personalities who then become subjective and who then become biased and we end up in the place we should not be. Finally, in the ballot, we have driven the economy right to the heart of this contest. And we are looking at democratizing the economy of Kenya. And that is why, with our partners in ANC and Fort Kenya, we have built an economic model around this election that gives us opportunity to expand and, and make sure that our economic model is inclusive. Make sure that the millions of our citizens who are today locked out of the economic cycle because they have no jobs, four million of our young people um, out of school, out of college, out of um, university, have no jobs, and it's not going to be business as usual. How are we going to do it differently? We're going to deliberately, and I could give examples later, deliberately invest 
in areas that are labor intensive, that create jobs, so that we can deal with the challenge of unemployment and create inclusivity. Number two, 80% of all our business is in the space of micro, small, and medium enterprise. We believe to create economic inclusion, this category who suffer three challenges. They do not have legislation to protect their business. They have challenges in the environment in which they operate. And when I say in the environment in which they operate, even huge corporates in Kenya will tell you they have a wall of licenses, 10 licenses, 15 licenses, that they have to suffer before they can get their business up and running. And finally, and this is especially for the micro and small enterprises, is the whole challenge of access to credit. It is really the elephant in that space. Let me give you an example. Because of the challenge of access to credit, we have a huge problem of predatory lenders. And because of predatory lenders, today, 15 million Kenyans are blacklisted on Credit Reference Bureau. 15 million Kenyans blacklisted is actually half our working population. That tells you there is a serious problem of access to credit. Many of these micro enterprises, research shows that many of them pay as high as 1,000% per year to access credit. Some 2,000% while corporate success credit at 10%, the micro and small enterprises access credit all the way to 1,000%. It's reasonably. These are enterprises that end up making a dollar, two dollars, maybe three dollars on a good day. And with just access to credit, reasonable credit, affordable credit, you can actually increase their income from two, three dollars to six, seven dollars. You can double their income just by making sure that we access credit. It's a challenge that we have, and it's a challenge we must deal with. Inclusivity again. And this is about the economy. And finally, um, we have to do something about the biggest sector that drives our economy. 25% of our GDP is contributed to by agriculture. 50% of our GDP agriculture plus all the linkages. So it's not possible to discuss the economy of our country without discussing agriculture. And agricultural transformation, right from interventions in seeds, interventions in fertilizer, interventions in market, interventions 